this symposium on our Holy Father. We are so blessed. Each of the Holy Fathers in our lifetime have brought such special gifts to the Church. Pope Francis has certainly been a great gift of God's providence. It is a joy to work with him as one of his advisors of the Council of Cardinals. The Holy Father is a man who listens, a man who, who consults a lot, individually and collectively, and out of that discernment is born his decisions. It's interesting to see the impact of his letter on the environment, and the whole world is talking about it, and I know that our young people who are so passionate about the environment are very enthused, and I'm pleased that this will be an opportunity for many of our young people to come into contact with the Magisterium. Hopefully it will broaden their concept of the Church. The Holy Father looks beyond the issues and asks the very important question, what kind of world do we want to leave for future generations? And as always, the Holy Father looks to the poor. He sees the connection between their condition and the fragility of the planet. See how the Holy Father's asceticism and simple lifestyle are so meaningful and so connected with the common good. Pope Francis is the first member of a religious order to be chosen Pope in many generations. In this year of consecrated life, it's fascinating to see the charism of Ignatian spirituality and the spirit of the poor men of Assisi marked in this new pontificate in such a profound way. I always tell people the story about the Jesuit and the Franciscan. We were walking down the street together one day, and a young man rushed up to them and said, Fathers, fathers, what novena do I have to say to get a BMW? And the Franciscan said, what's a BMW? And the Jesuit said, what's a novena? We have a Pope who defies these categories and seems to have melded the Jesuit and the Franciscan into one. But I believe that Pope Francis is the quintessential Ignatian Jesuit, and that is the hermeneutical key to understanding him. Miguel de Unamuno wrote a biography of Don Quixote, the protagonist of Cervantes' masterpiece which is probably the most influential novel ever written before the Da Vinci Code, of course. <laughs> Uno Nuno begins his biography of Don Quixote with an ingenious comparison of Don Quixote and St. Ignatius of Loyola, drawn from Cervantes' description of the Man of La Mancha and Rivadeneda's biography of the founder of the Jesuits. Unamuno describes how Ignatius set out for Montserrat to deposit his arms at the feet of the Virgin. On the road to Montserrat, he encountered a Moor who denied the virginity of the Blessed Mother. Ignatius tried to convince him without success, and the Moor rode away very conceited and arrogant. The young Ignatius had second thoughts and wondered if he should have punished the man. Ignatius wanted to let God decide, so he dropped the reins of his steed to see if the animal would pursue the recalcitrant moor or continue on the road to the sanctuary of Montserrat. The beast trotted off to Montserrat and the Jesuit order was founded. By the way, Unamuno credited that donkey with the founding of the Society of Jesus. <laughs> The early biographers recount how St. Ignatius 
was wounded in the Battle of Pamplona, and he spent much of his convalescence reading. Because there were no books of chivalry, for Ignatius, like Quixote, was addicted to books of chivalry, they gave him the patient Ludwig of Satin, Saxon's Life of Christ, and a florilegium of the lives of the saints. After devouring the books, Francis announced, I want, Ignatius announced, I want to be a saint like St. Francis. Well, we have a Pope who has embraced the vocation of being a follower of Ignatius, who wants to be a saint like St. Francis. Our Pope is thoroughly Jesuit, thoroughly Ignatian, right down to the fascination with St. Francis. In his interview with Civiltà Cattolica, Father Antonio Spadero asked Pope Francis why he became a Jesuit. The Pope said there were three things about the Jesuits that were attractive to him. The missionary spirit, community, and discipline. He especially admired the way the Jesuits managed their time. It's quite obvious that Pope Francis exhibits these characteristics in spades. He is truly living his Jesuit vocation with an intense missionary zeal, a love for community and for mission, and the disciplined life that does not waste anything, especially not time. I love the image of Pope Francis running around the Vatican turning off the lights. It kind of reminds me of my dad. <laughs> Shortly before his ordination, the 32-year-old Bergoglio wrote a short credo. He has kept that piece of paper as a reminder of his core ideals. It's a clear indication of the habit of self-reflection so deeply ingrained by his Jesuit formation. He speaks of his own history and says that on that spring day of September, in the Southern Hemisphere, September is the spring, the loving face of God crossed my path and invited me to follow him. The Holy Father is always hearkening back to the day of his own spiritual awakening and conversion on the feast of St. Matthew that found him breaking away from his friends to go to church to receive the sacrament of confession. It was there that he first felt called. Later he shared that his famous painting in Rome is Caravaggio's Calling of Matthew, where Jesus is pointing at the tax collector. Bergoglio said that when he looks at that painting, he feels that Jesus is pointing at him. It's not surprising that Father Bergoglio, when appointed bishop, chose the phrase miserando arque eligendo, having mercy and calling me, from the homily of the Venerable Bede on the Feast of St. Matthew, the publican converted and called to be apostle. The experience as a 17-year-old was, in his words, the astonishment of an encounter, of encountering someone who is waiting for you. God is the one who seeks us first. The Holy Father, even views morality in the context of an encounter with Christ that is triggered by mercy. The privileged locus of the encounter is the caress of the mercy of Jesus Christ on our sins, and thus a new morality, a correspondence to mercy, is born. He sees this morality as a revolution. It is not a titanic effort of the will, but simply a response to a surprising, unforeseeable, and unjust mercy. Morality is not about never falling down, but about always getting up again. Pope Francis embraces the introspection that is so central to Jesuit spirituality. The practice of the examine, the mental prayer, reflection, a review of how one is living one's vocation, was Ignatius's plan to keep the Jesuits recollected in God focused despite their many activist lifestyles. As a novice master, Father Jorge Bergoglio insisted on fidelity to the practice of examen. 
realizing that Ignatius' strict program of formation was to prepare men for years of self-discipline once all the props of formation were taken away. In keeping with his own Jesuit formation, Pope Francis is a man of discernment, and at times that discernment results in freeing him from the confine of doing things in a certain way because it was always thus. There are many indications that Pope Francis is very comfortable in his own skin and does not feel constrained by practices of pontificates of the past. But to me, one of the most striking examples of this clarity of vision and confidence was his decision to celebrate his first Holy Thursday Mass as Pope at the Casal de Marmo detention center, washing the feet of a group of prisoners there. On the Holy, on Holy Thursday, Jesus washed the feet of the twelve. They were shocked and unhinged by the experience. St. Peter rebelled at the thought and capitulated only because Jesus insisted. For most of us, it has become a rather stylized liturgical gesture, but that is but a weak reflection of what the original foot washing entailed. Pope Francis replicated the surprise and the shock of the apostles, even as he dismayed those who preferred the stylized liturgy of the Basilica. This was not an innovation for Pope Francis, for as Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he'd been doing this each year in Holy Week. While many were surprised that the Holy Father did not opt to celebrate the Holy Thursday Mass as other popes had in the Basilica of St. John Lateran, the Holy Father was jostling our imagination because we have grown so complacent that we can no longer see beyond the familiar custom to glimpse the challenging truth. With a simple gesture, and this is a man who speaks in gestures, the Holy Father was challenging core assumptions about power, authority, and leadership. As he told the prisoners, this is a symbol, he said, it's a sign. Washing your feet means I am at your service. In his address to the Brazilian bishops at the World Youth Day in Rio de Janeiro, Pope Francis said, unless we train ministers capable of warming people's hearts, of walking with them in the night, of dialoguing with their hopes and disappointments, of mending their brokenness, what joy can we have for our present and future journey? Father Jorge Bergoglio's former novices recount how Father Bergoglio always insisted that the seminarian should go on the weekends to the poorest neighborhoods to give catechism classes to the children. He used to tell them that if someone could make the catechism simple enough for a child to understand, that is a wise person. And when the seminarians returned from the barrios, from these poor neighborhoods, Father Bergoglio would always check to see if they had dusty shoes. If a seminarian didn't have mud on his shoes, that man had some explaining to do. The same desire to teach the young Jesuits to stay engaged with the people, to be close to the little ones, is what Jesus did when he was training his apostles. He took them to the temple to observe the widow, putting her last penny in the collection. The Lord doesn't refund her money, applaud her, or give her a compliment. She is totally unaware that she is being observed as Jesus uses her as part of his lesson plan to his seminarian apostles. He helps them to see the poor widow through his eyes. Jesus wants his priest to see the faith and the devotion of the unwin, the poor who are rich in faith. We have much to learn from the poor. Pope Francis in Evangelii Gaudium reminds us that God's heart has a special place for the poor, so much that he himself became poor. The entire history of our redemption is marked by the presence of the poor. In his inaugural address at the synagogue at Nazareth, Jesus uses the prophecy of Isaiah to describe his own messianic mission. 
The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Jesus assured those burdened by sorrow and crushed by poverty that God has a special place for them in his heart. Blessed are the poor, yours is the kingdom of heaven. Pope Francis is most eloquent in his advocacy on behalf of the poor and our obligation to help them by programs of promotion and assistance, as well as by working to resolve the structural causes of poverty. However, one of Pope Francis's most impassioned pleas on behalf of the poor concerns their pastoral care. In Evangelii Gaudi, the Holy Father writes, I want to say with regret that the worst discrimination which the poor suffer is the lack of spiritual care. The great majority of the poor have a special openness to the faith. They need God, and we must not fail to offer them his friendship, his blessing, his words, the celebration of the sacraments, and a journey of growth and maturity in the faith. Our preferential option for the poor must mainly translate into a privileged and preferential religious care. Reading that passage from Evangelii Gaudium reminds me of something that happened to me many years ago when I was working at the Centro Catolico. There had been a terrible earthquake in Guatemala. Thousands of people perished. A former priest who was working at a secular relief organization came to seek my help in contacting some remote indigenous tribes in Guatemala. His agency wanted to fund a project for the poorest and the neediest. I arranged for a friend to take this individual to a very remote mountain village where he made known his agency's offer to the people. He told them to choose any one project, a school, a clinic, potable water, the elders of the tribe asked for time to discuss the proposal with the members of the tribe. After their deliberation, the chief returned and said to this former priest, Sir, what we need more than anything else is new doors for our church. Needless to say, my friend was shocked and embarrassed. I'm not sure how he negotiated this with his agency. I think he paid for the doors himself. The interesting thing is that the Indians, despite all their physical needs, felt that their relationship with God was their most pressing need. Pope Francis would have understood that immediately. The young Orde Bergoglio joined the Jesuits in part out of a desire to be a missionary and go to Japan. It's hard to read Pope Francis's challenge to go to the periphery without recalling the letter of Francis Xavier to St. Ignatius that appears in the breviary for the feast of the great Jesuit missionary. Francis Xavier's letter contains this passionate plea to his fellow priests. Many, many people are not becoming Christians for one reason. There's no one to help them be Christians. Again and again I've thought about going around to the universities of Europe, especially Paris, and everywhere crying out like a madman, riveting the attention of those with more learning than charity. What a tragedy. How many souls are being lost thanks to you. I wish that they would work as hard as this as they do in their books and so settle their account with God by doing something for the missions. I can imagine Pope Francis writing that same letter himself. Pope Francis never went to the mission of Japan but he never ceased to admire those Jesuit missionaries and others who formed the faith of the laity so well in those Christian communities in Japan that survived without priests for over 250 years. In 1865, two years after Matthew Perry opened Japan to foreigners, Father Bernard Petitjean of the Mission Estrangère de Paris opened a church for foreign nationals in Japan but was immediately visited by throngs of underground Catholics who had practiced their faith clandestinely for over 200 years. The French priests found them all baptized, catechized, and married, and all of their dead had received Christian burial. 
as Pope Francis observed, faith was kept intact by the gifts of grace that gladdened the lives of the laity, who only received baptism, but then continued to live their apostolic mission. Pope Francis, like Pope Benedict, has said that Catholicism is not a catalog of prohibitions. He urges us to be positive, to emphasize the things that unite us, not the negative, the things that divide us. You must prioritize the connection between people, the path we walk together. After that, addressing the differences becomes easier. The Holy Father says that every form of catechesis should attend to the way of beauty, the via pulgritudinus, showing that to follow Christ is not only something right and true, but also something beautiful, capable of filling life with a new splendor and profound joy, even in the midst of difficulties. As for the moral component of catechesis, which promotes growth and fidelity to the gospel way of life, it's helpful to stress again and again the attractiveness and the ideal of a life of wisdom, self-fulfillment, and enrichment. In the light of that positive message, our rejection of the evils which endanger that life can be better understood. Rather than experts in dire predictions, dour judgments, bent on rooting out every threat and deviation, we should appear as joyful messengers of challenging proposals, guardians of the goodness and beauty which shine forth in the life of fidelity to the gospel. A fascinating study funded by Lilly Foundation resulted in the acronym MTD, Moralistic Therapeutic Deism. The author of the studies, Smith and Denton, invented this term to describe the common religious belief among Americans, especially young Americans. It's a religion that is about being nice, feeling good, and having God as some sort of fire extinguisher case of emergency, break the glass and say a prayer. What is missing is the charisma, the love of God that sent Christ into the world to die on the cross, rise again, and accompany us to the end of time. Besides MTD, we find a compelling critique of American religion by Ross Dutha in his provocative book, Bad Religion, How We Became a Nation of Heretics. Do that to raise the popularity of so many brands of bad religion, from the prosperity gospel to the portrayal of God as a life coach, aberrations of religion that have bred righteousness, greed, and self-absorption. Pope Francis is not a proponent of moralistic therapeutic deism or the bad religion that has become so fashionable in our day. In his apostolic constitution, Evangelii Gaudium, he begins with the words, The joy of the gospel fills the hearts and minds of all who encounter Jesus. The Pope is a true companion of Jesus, a Jesuit who puts Christ at the center of his life. At the center of the Church's mission is the announcement of the Kerygma. The Kerygma is Trinitarian. The fire of the Spirit leads us to believe in Jesus Christ, who by his death and resurrection reveals and communicates to us the Father's infinite mercy. Pope Francis writes in Evangelii Gaudium, on the lips of the Catechist, the first proclamation must ring out over and over. Jesus Christ loves you. He gave his life to save you, and now he's living at your side every day to enlighten, strengthen, and free you. The document of Aparecida, much influenced by the then Cardinal Bergoglio, talks about the need to form missionary disciples. The kerygma is central in this process. The kerygma is not simply a stage, but the leitmotif of a process that culminates in the maturity of the disciple of Jesus Christ. Without the kerygma, the other aspects of the process are condemned to sterility with hearts not truly converted to the Lord. Hence the Church should have the kerygma present in all its actions. In the midst of a culture that glorifies individualism and the imperial autonomous self, 
the Pope and Aparecida speak to us about communion. There can be no Christian life except in community, in families, parishes, communities of consecrated life, base communities, other small communities and movements. Like the early Christians who met in community, the disciples take part in the life of the church and in the encounter with brothers and sisters, living the life of Christ in solidarity, in fraternal life. The Holy Father speaks so much about the culture of encounter and the art of accompaniment in mentoring people in the faith. His message is very different from the New Age individualism of I'm very spiritual but not very religious attitude that thrives in today's climate. In a world that is so often polarized and divided, Pope Francis' message has brought hope into people's lives and enticed many people to look at the church again. The field hospital imagery is more compelling than that of a museum or a concert hall. Most Catholics have felt energized by the focus on God's love and mercy and on the clarion call to embody the ideals of the church's social gospel in our relations with others, especially the most vulnerable and forgotten. The Holy Father has made us more aware of Lazarus, covered with sores, who is on our doorstep, suffering alone, while we are absorbed in pursuit of entertainment and creature comforts in a globalization of indifference. He reminds us sometimes we lose our enthusiasm for mission because we forget that the gospel responds to our deepest needs, since we were created for what the gospel offers us, friendship with Jesus and love of our brothers and sisters. I spent 20 years in Washington working with immigrants. In those days, there was a curious incident that I will always remember. Wilbur Mills was a longtime speaker in the House, a one-time presidential candidate. Mills was involved in a traffic incident in 1974. His car was stopped by the U.S. Park Police late at night because he was driving without his lights. It was discovered that Mills was intoxicated, and he was with Annabelle Vastastella, professionally known as Fanny Fox, the Argentine firecracker. In an attempt to escape, they leapt from the car and jumped into the nearby tidal basin. One month later, Mill was to be on the ballot in his home state in Arkansas for re-election to Congress. While his office denied that he had a drinking problem, Jack Anderson reported that if his staff said, you can't speak with him now, he's on the floor, it was never clear what that meant. <laughs> in the election, a month after the scandal, Mill's challengers came up with the ditty. If you like liquor, sex, and thrills, cast your vote for Wilbur Mills. <laughs> Wilbur Mills won handily with 60%. <laughs> he had asked for forgiveness from his constituencies and explained to them that his problems were a result of cavorting with foreigners. <laughs> Well, for 20 years I was in Washington cavorting with foreigners, working at the Centro Cattolico Hispano. I did not find this to be a corrupting influence on my life, but rather an uplifting experience and indeed a great privilege. Coming from a lace curtain Irish community in the Midwest, being thrust into the challenges and sufferings of the immigrant community was truly an eye opener. Shortly after arriving at the Centro Cattolico, I was visited by a man who was obviously a campesino from El Salvador, who sat across from me at my desk and broke down and wept bitterly. He was so overcome with grief that he was unable to speak. He simply handed me a letter from his wife back in El Salvador, who took him to task for having abandoned her and their six children to penury and starvation. When the man was able to compose himself, he explained to me that he'd come to Washington like so many, because of the war raging in his country, it was impossible to sustain his family there by farming. He found a coyote, a smuggler, who brought him to Washington, where he shared a room with several other men in similar circumstances. He washed dishes in two restaurants, 
one at lunch time and one at dinner time. He, left the, he ate the leftover food on the dirty plates so as not to spend any money. He walked to work so that he wouldn't have to use car fare, so that he could send all of his money back to his family. He said that each week he sent all of the money back, but now his wife had written to him to say that she had not received one letter from him. I asked him if he sent a check or cash. He said, Father, I sent cash. He described how he put it in an envelope, put the amount of stamps that people told him was necessary, and then dropped it in the blue mailbox in the corner. I looked out the window and I could see the blue mailbox. The problem was it was not a mailbox at all, but a fancy trash bin. That encounter certainly brought home to me how difficult it is to be an immigrant, to be a stranger in a strange land, and experience countless humiliations and deprivations as one struggles to make enough money to feed one's children. The immigrants turn to the church as their spiritual family, and for their part have contributed so much joy and vitality. In those days, the Hispanics were beginning to arrive in Washington, D.C. Now, 40 years later, they make up half of the Catholic population. Pope Francis has focused the world on the plight of the immigrants. I just read yesterday there are 60 million refugees this year. The Holy Father made his first trip as Pope to Lampedusa. When the Holy Father went to the Isle of Lampedusa, he threw a wreath of flowers into the sea where thousands of refugees had perished in the modern-day coffin ships that bring refugees from North Africa to Europe. The Holy Father talked about the globalization of indifference, indifference to the suffering of others, to the fate of the unborn, the elderly, the handicapped, the mentally ill, and the refugees. We must overcome this indifference in our own lives and help people to see that the church's teaching is about loving and caring for everyone. In his talk to the Brazilian bishops, Pope Francis said, we need a church capable of rediscovering the maternal womb of mercy. Without mercy, we have little chance nowadays of entering the world of wounded persons in need of understanding, forgiveness, and love. The truth is that without mercy, the truth can be cold, off-putting, and can wound. The truth isn't a wet rag that you throw in someone's face, but should be a warm cape that you wrap around the person to protect and strengthen them. Our efforts to heal the wounds of society will depend on our capacity to love and to be faithful to our mission. The Holy Father is showing us very clearly that our struggle is not just a political battle or a legal problem, but that we must evangelize and humanize the culture. Then the world will be safe for the unborn, the elderly, and the unproductive. The gospel of life is a gospel of mercy. If we're going to get a hearing in today's world, it will be because people recognize that authenticity of our lives and our dedication to building a civilization of love. We are called to live our lives as a service to others and commit our lives to give witness to the presence of God's love and mercy in our midst. I often share with people the story of a man who went to the doctor because he was very sick and needed a series of tests. And during the time he was receiving this test, the doctor asked to speak to his wife alone. The doctor said, your husband is very, very seriously sick, and he is going to survive only if you take extraordinary care of him. She said, doctor, what do you mean? She said, well, you should prepare for him his favorite meals, let him go to the ball games, fishing with his buddies, don't ask him to take the garbage out or cut the grass, make sure the children don't bother him. Give him the remote control for the television set, and don't invite his mother-in-law over. In the car, the man was very nervous. He said, what did the doctor say? What did the doctor say? She said, honey, the doctor said you're going to die. <laughs> well, 
It's like that story. If we don't go the extra mile, give our cloak along with the tunic, turn the other cheek, then the patient will die. As St. Augustine said, without God, we can do nothing. Without us, God will do nothing. Pope Francis said in Rio de Janeiro to three million youth on the Copacabana beach, Jesus Christ is counting on you. The church is counting on you. May Mary, the mother of Jesus, and our mother, always accompany you with her tenderness. Go, make disciples of all nations.